About a month ago, I watched Shafila's Productions YouTube video, Every Wes Anderson Movie Ranked. Even though I had only seen two of his 11 films before this, we'll say which ones those were later, I decided to give it a watch. Once the video was done, I decided that all of the movies, even the ones placed near the bottom, seemed too intriguing for me not to watch. So, aided by numerous semi-legal, free-to-watch movie websites, I embarked on a mission. Watch every Wes Anderson film. Now that that journey is finished, here are my thoughts on each, going in chronological order. I will not be ranking them, as I don't like doing that, but I'll mention which ones are my favorite and least favorite. Spoilers ahead, fair warning. Also, I know this isn't at all what I normally talk about on my channel, but I wrote this originally as an article for my Medium page, and the urge to turn it into a video was too strong. Don't worry, I'll be talking about music in my next video, which is very much in the works. I don't make any money from this channel anyway, so I really have full freedom to do whatever I want. Also, not showing my face in this vid because I'm tired and don't have the energy to set up my camera. Bottle Rocket is a strange film in Anderson's filmography. His unique directing style hadn't fully developed yet, so this feels a lot like a film anyone could have made. Don't get me wrong, given that this is his first feature-length film, one shot on a budget of only $5 million, this is a really enjoyable watch. If you want to make sure your two male leads have good chemistry with each other, casting two brothers to play them is a surefire way to do that. Owen and Luke Wilson do a great job playing characters with varying personalities, and yet still clearly care for each other. That's not to say that they're the only two actors who do a good job. Robert Musgrave as Bob Mapplethorpe and Lumi Cavazos as Inez are the two other standouts. Cavazos in particular has great chemistry with Luke Wilson, and her romance feels genuinely sweet, even though they're barely able to communicate given their language barrier. Of course, the third Wilson brother, Andrew, does a great job with his limited screen time. As good as it is, it's not perfect. Much of the film could be summed up as the character characters hanging out at a motel. A lot of times while watching, I found myself yearning for something that actually happened. Still, this is a solid first effort and a very worthwhile viewing experience. Also, this might sound very specific, but this film reminds me a lot of The Big Lebowski. I don't know why, but it just does. Talk about avoiding a sophomore slump. After Bottle Rocket bombed at the box office, making a proper follow-up was essential to making sure that he wouldn't slip into obscurity in the film world. This film nearly didn't end up being as good as it was, with Jason Schwartzman only being cast at the 11th hour. His acting is my favorite part of the movie. As someone who was a weird 16-year-old who struggled with relating to others, I can relate to his Max Fisher character a lot, but not entirely, as you'll see later. You just know that if Max was around today, he would be the admin for like 10 different subreddits. The fact that Schwartzman was only 18 when the movie was filmed makes him feel all the more believable. Similar to how Michael Sarah was only 18 when Superbad was filmed, the best teenage characters in film are almost always played by, well, actual teenagers. This film also had Anderson's first big-name actor, with Bill Murray as the other male lead. He and Schwartzman have great chemistry despite their significant age difference. As someone who was close with a lot of my male teachers growing up, again, I didn't understand people my age, I found their relationship fun to watch. On a similar note, I thought that Olivia Williams did a great job as Ms. Cross. You can really understand her problems in the movie. On one hand, she cares about Fisher as a person and enjoys talking with him, but on the other hand, she's very clearly uncomfortable with all of his advances toward her. That leads to my main problem with this movie. While I get that students having crushes on teachers isn't itself problematic, some of Max's actions towards Ms. Cross feel a little too much like sexual harassment. As far as the worst thing he does, take your pick between him forcibly trying to kiss her, or successfully tricking her into letting him kiss her by pretending to be injured. It got to a point where I was kind of hoping that she would tell him to fuck off just for her own sake, so her dancing with him at the end felt like she was being a little too generous. Doesn't ruin the movie though, and I'm happy Max ends up a better person at the end. Also, I thought this dude's Scottish accent was a little over the top. Picking a kid like Duck because his mother's a great piece and then getting nowhere. Until I looked it up and found out that he actually is Scottish. This is Wes's first proper home run film. 
This is the one where he settled on the visual and writing quirks that continue to define him today. Going in, I didn't expect this to be as heavy as it ended up being. Each member of the Tenenbaum family has significant issues that they've clearly been repressing for a while. I kind of feel bad for Danny Glover's Mr. Sherman for marrying into this dysfunctional bunch of misfits. Despite its heaviness, this still manages to be a very funny movie. Gene Hackman in particular is hilarious. Every scene he's in, he'll have at least one banger of a line. Mm -hmm. His Your mother was a terribly attractive woman line lives in my head rent-free to this day. This was one of his last live-action roles before retiring, but with how good he is in this one, he easily could have kept going for a much longer time with the talent he still had in him. Aside from him, there are many subtle things I find amusing, such as how Ben Stiller's Chaz Tenenbaum and his sons always wear matching tracksuits, and it's never acknowledged, let alone explained. Outside of Hackman, the rest of the Tenenbaum family is equally enjoyable to watch, this is the first time Anderson was able to utilize the ensemble cast format he loved so much, and he made some very good casting choices. Gwyneth Paltrow as the adopted Margot Tenenbaum manages to come off as subdued while never being boring, per se. Angelica Houston... wait, wrong photo. There we go. As Ethelene, the matriarch of the household, fits the role perfectly. And even the honorary Tenenbaum, Eli Cash, played by Owen Wilson, makes sure that there's never a dull moment in any of his scenes. Speaking of the Wilson brothers, holy cow does Luke kill it as Richie Tenenbaum. Maybe this is just me, but in every scene he's in, he radiates sadness and pent-up frustration, which is impressive given that you can barely see his eyes most of the time. I can see why some people might take issue with his crush on Margot given that they were raised together, but personally I didn't find it too objectionable. No blood between them, after all. Visually, this movie is stunning. I'm not just saying that because as a New York City native, I was thrilled to see a Wes Anderson movie set in a place I knew. The Tenenbaum's house feels like a dollhouse at times, and it makes the scenes set there very fun to look at. Even aside from the sets, I love the camera work in scenes such as the wedding chase towards the end. The costume designs are cool too. There's the aforementioned matching jumpsuits between Chaz and his kids, and the fact that Richie is wearing a tennis headband for most of the movie. It might just be a small little detail, but I found it cute. One last thing, killer soundtrack choices, Wes. I said at the beginning that I wouldn't be ranking the movies, but I'd say which are my favorite and least favorite. Well, this is my least favorite. To be clear, this is by no means a bad movie. Anderson isn't capable of making one, and I've come across people online who praise this intensely. I'll admit, this movie still manages to be an interesting experience to watch. Visually, it's as superb as usual. I love the use of stop motion effects, not only with the jaguar shark at the end, but the small creatures that show up periodically throughout the film. I also love the costume designs. Seeing the whole crew in matching outfits, beanies, and sneakers is a fun visual detail. While it's not related to the actual plot, I also love the one crew member whose sole job is to play guitar and sing David Bowie songs. Lucky bastard. As is the case with all his movies, there are a good amount of funny moments. As a lover of dry humor, Bill Murray as a titular lead had me chuckling a good bit. This also leads me to the first problem I have with the movie. While Murray is funny sometimes, there are also a lot of scenes where he just seems tired. That's a tricky thing about writing deadpan comedy in film. That's very easy to have it come off as more boring than funny. Murray's scenes have about a 50-50 funny to boring ratio by my count. The funny bits are good, but they don't happen often enough. The biggest problem is that the movie is just too damn long. It's as longest at an hour and 58 minutes, and while that's not automatically a bad thing, it is if the time isn't utilized properly. The main event of the film is Zizou's ocean expedition, but it takes a surprisingly long time for that to actually happen. Don't get me wrong, I know that they had to set the stage for things, but I feel a good amount of it could have been cut. Once they're on the boat, things don't get much more exciting. My favorite bits are the pirate hijacking and the romance subplot between Kate Blanchett's Jane and Owen Wilson's Ned, but a lot of the film just drags a bit. At least Sigurros got to be featured on the soundtrack. 
I get the impression that this film is somewhat divisive. Forbes has it ranked second to last in their ranking of Anderson's films, Variety has it last, and it has the second lowest Rotten Tomatoes score. Really? Personally, I had a really fun time watching this. I can certainly see why some people might not. The film has a very small main cast consisting of just Jason Schwartzman, Adrian Brody, Daddy, and Owen Wilson playing brothers Jack, Peter, and Francis Whitman. If you don't find them enjoyable to watch, then the whole movie is going to be pretty difficult to sit through. For women in particular, the lack of a character to latch onto for most of the film might prove challenging. I've also come across people online who think that this film has an orientalist depiction of India. I'm not going to tell people what they should and shouldn't be offended by, but at least to me, there was no part of the film that came off as blatantly racist for what it's worth. Nothing worse than some of Apu's bits on The Simpsons. I really enjoy each of the three main actors. I don't have any brothers myself, so when it comes to judging brotherly relationships in film, it can be a little challenging. That being said, I completely believe the three of them are siblings. Each of them is played to perfection. I love how Francis is constantly talking about how the trip they're on is an important spiritual journey for them to take so they can heal from their father's death. All the while, Peter and Jack are just not buying it at all. I think the bit during the middle of the film where they attend the funeral of the boy Peter failed to save from drowning was really well done. Wow. As three sons dealing with their father's death, them seeing a father deal with his son's death felt fitting somehow. The flashback scene was another great positive. I also love the look of this film. After three films set in boring old America and one film set on a fucking boat, the setting and location of Darjeeling adds some much needed variety to Anderson's filmography. That being said, I do think this film could have used a little more in terms of actual plot. Nothing wrong with character-driven films, especially when the characters was fun to watch as this, but I would have liked for more stuff to actually happen. Taking a 96-page children's novel and turning it into a stop-motion feature film was a bold move for Wes to make, but boy does he pull it off. I was six years old when this came out and I still remember seeing trailers and advertisements for it. I also remember watching it around that same time and I really enjoyed it. This is a film that you can enjoy no matter how old you are. As proof, I watched it again for the sake of this project, and I loved it just as much, if not more. A term I hear thrown around a lot when discussing Anderson's films is whimsical, and this one certainly is. It's supposed to be whimsical, though. It's a kid's film. The whimsy is balanced with enough actual stakes so that it's not just non-stop sunshine and rainbows. When Mrs. Fox scolds Mr. Fox for putting their family in danger just for the sake of getting some thrills, it hits hard, as it should. I also love the scene at the end with the wolf. As much as Mr. Fox loves to talk about how he has to do what he does because he's a wild animal, that scene shows him that there are animals more wild than he ever will be. This might be random, but when I first saw this movie as a young lad, I remember being really attached to Jason Schwartzman's character, Ash, Mr. Fox's son. I guess I just thought he was cool. As a young kid growing attached to a fox, it could have led me down a pretty strange path. Luckily, I turned out mostly normal. This is easily one of Anderson's best looking films. A lot of this is by design, since the animation medium allows far greater control over visuals. You're no longer restricted by what's physically possible to film. I love the way they made the English countryside setting look, from the orange-tinted sky to all of the fields. The character models all look superb, and this goes for the human characters too. For Bogus, Bunce, and Bean, one fat, one short, one lean, in particular, they do a good job of staying true to the spirit of the book descriptions, while at the same time not making things too absurd. As far as the animation goes, one of my favorite parts is at the end when they let the rabid beagle loose. The resulting panic is so chaotic looking and I just appreciate that they took the time to animate it as well as they did, especially with how painstaking of a process stop motion is. This guy playing the banjo is another small detail I like. I doubt his hand movements are accurate to the music, but I don't care. The voice actors on this one are amazing. Anderson was able to get both George Clooney and Meryl Streep, Queen, to play the Fox parents, and both of them did a great job. Clooney delivers his lines in a way that makes it sound like he's smiling the whole time, except when he shouldn't be. And Meryl, well, she's Meryl Streep. 
Everything she does is good. Jason Schwartzman does a great job as Ash, managing to sound as much like a 12-year-old as a 29-year-old man possibly can, and Wallace Wolodarski fits perfectly as Kylie, Mr. Fox's mild-mannered opossum accomplice. I also think it's wholesome that Wes gave his little brother, Eric, a leading role as Mr. Fox's nephew, Christopherson. Like Fantastic Mr. Fox, this is a very whimsical movie. Also like Fantastic Mr. Fox, a lot of this is by design, as the movie centers around two tweens in love with each other. I find this to be the easiest to watch of all of his movies. The plot is easy to follow, the characters are straightforward, and it's a very fun viewing experience. This was the first movie I watched when I embarked on this project, and I'm glad I picked this one, since it was a great warm-up for everything that came after. For someone who hasn't seen any of Anderson's films, I would suggest this one. It was also the first film of his that I re-watched. I, I, I just found it that charming. I really love the setting of this film. As someone who grew up in New York City, as much as I enjoy movies set in my hometown, such as the aforementioned Royal Tenenbaums, I'm also fascinated by films set in places completely unlike where I grew up. For Moonrise Kingdom, I found myself wishing I was standing in the middle of the woods where it takes place. Acting-wise, Ed Norton makes his first appearance in an Anderson film as the Scoutmaster, and oh my god was this role made for him. Check out those shorts. I can't think of anyone else better fit to play an eccentric scoutmaster who takes his job a little too seriously. The two main characters, Sam and Susie, are wonderfully played by Jared Gilman and Kara Hayward, respectively. Given that they were only 13 when this was filmed, their great performances are all the more impressive. The entire scout is well acted, too. Child actors can be pretty hit or miss, but they hit on all the children in this movie. I love the scene where they all decide to go and help bring Sam and Susie back together. The second half of this this movie definitely drags somewhat, and a lot of that is because Sam and Susie don't get as much time to themselves. Their chemistry together is a huge part of why this movie is as good as it is. Jason Schwartzman showing up is a beacon of light though, and you can tell he's enjoying his role. I also wish that Bruce Willis's character and Sam got to have more bits together before he adopts him at the end. Obviously I'm happy Sam gets a stable home, but it just doesn't have the impact it should. All in all, this is just a simple cute movie and I love it. Part of me wishes the fictional books Susie likes were real. Come on, covers like that and I'm supposed to not be intrigued? This is my favorite Wes Anderson movie, and it's not really a competition. It was the other film I had seen before this project, and upon rewatching, I was no less in awe. Where do I begin? Let's start with the visuals. This film uses color better than any other film Anderson has made. I'm not usually the biggest fan of pink, but the way it's used in the set design of the hotel is flawless. It really does make it seem as much a palace as it is a hotel. When contrasted with the drab state of the hotel when the author visits it, it stands out even more. It might be a small detail, but I love how the hotel staff all wear purple. It fits with the palette very well. Aside from the hotel settings, I also really loved the design of the alpine setting in the final act of the film. While watching it, I almost felt myself shivering. That's how engrossing it was. Of course, it goes without saying that the camera work and shot framing are as superb as they always are in an Anderson film. Now on to the casting. Rafe Fiennes could not have done a better job as Gustav. It was funny for me to see him in this movie since I'd already seen him play the evil Nazi officer Amon Guth in Schindler's List. The man's got range. He's chewing the scenery for sure, but it fits so well. Tony Revolori as Zero is the perfect foil for Gustav. You can tell that he's fiercely loyal on one hand, but also very perplexed by Gustav's antics on the other. F. Murray Abraham as Elderly Zero is just as good and perfectly portrays the same character, but beaten down by time and clearly mourning those to him that have since passed, namely the aforementioned Gustav, as well as his late wife Agatha, played masterfully by Saoirse Ronan. In terms of villains, Adrian Brody is terrific, and you can tell he's glad to have a proper role again after being completely left out of Moonrise Kingdom and only being in one scene for Fantastic Mr. Fox. He's so over the top that I can't help but chuckle at almost every line he says. What's the meaning of this shit? Willem Dafoe is the hitman is superb. He has a menacing aura around him, and he brings a sense of danger into every scene he's in. I haven't even mentioned Jeff Goldblum, Harvey Keitel, and Tilda Swinton, but take my word for it that they do a great job. Finally, let's talk about the theme. Nostalgia is a powerful thing. 
The characters in this film yearn to return to a time long gone, one since destroyed by totalitarianism. The hotel Zero owns when he tells the story to the author is one that barely bears any resemblance to the one he first started working at. Despite that, he can't possibly sell it, since that would be severing his last tie to the man he loyally served and the woman he loved in a time when everything was simpler and better than it is now. By the time the story is being read by the girl in the graveyard, the hotel is demolished and everyone in the story has died. All that remains are memories. Part of me kind of wishes that this was a ranked list so that this could be my big climactic ending, but as it happens, it isn't. This was an interesting viewing experience, and not just because I was watching a movie about dogs while being a cat person. This is the other Wes Anderson film that's criticized for being Orientalist, and I definitely do feel it a little more strongly here. That's not a topic I know enough about to even attempt to discuss, but I will say that it very much feels like it was made by a white guy whose only exposure to Japanese culture was depictions in Western media. That being said, as is the case with the Darjeeling Limited, it never came across as blatantly racist, and it's clear that Wes meant well. Now onto the actual quality of the movie. It's not bad. The movie cuts back and forth between the human world and the titular Isle of Dogs. The dogs are definitely my favorite part. Ed Norton, Jeff Goldblum, Bill Murray, and the Anderson newcomer Brian Cranston all bring their A-game, voice acting-wise. And it feels like they're all in the same room together, chatting away. And that's to say nothing about Harvey Keitel, Angelica Houston, and F. Murray Abraham, who they managed to get back for another role. Visually, the aisle itself looks great. I'm once again impressed by the attention to detail. The thing about Wes Anderson movies is that even if the writing doesn't get you, at the very least, they'll be fun to look at. Can't say I enjoyed the human characters as much, though. Atari was decent enough given the role he plays in the story, and the mayor works alright as an intimidating villain. I really didn't dig Greta Gerwig's character that much. I know I said that this movie didn't exactly come off as racist, but having the anti-government movement be spearheaded by the only white girl in the whole movie eh, feels a tad too white savior for my tastes nonetheless. Random, but I can't believe they actually got Yoko Ono for this movie. I don't have a whole lot to say about this movie, but I would still definitely recommend you watch it just for the spectacle of the animation. This movie is... weird. That's a good thing, don't worry. It was the last film I watched in my journey that I hadn't seen before, since I saved Grand Budapest for the end. I knew in advance that it was an anthology movie, a format that I don't have much experience with, but I found it to be a great experience. First off, I find it kind of sweet that this whole movie is just Anderson's love letter to the New Yorker. You can get away with stuff like that when you're rich and famous. The fact that the movie itself is great helps a lot. Visually, this movie might be the best in his whole filmography. The switching back and forth between black and white and color can catch you off guard at first, but once I got used to it, I really dug it. The settings are all perfectly designed. The fictional town of Henri sur Blasé is really cool to look at, and while viewing, I imagined living there myself. Of course, each of the anthology shorts look special in their own way. For the first short, the prison looks as bleak as you'd expect a French prison back in the day to look like, exactly the kind of place you'd keep a dangerous psychopath. For the second short, the club where the students all hang out looks exactly like the kind of place you'd expect a bunch of hedonistic young people to blow off some steam. But the third short... Well, I guess I didn't really have much expectations as to what a police negotiation standoff would look like. However, the third short does have an absolutely terrific animation scene that's one of the film's highlights. It reminds me a lot of Tintin. And I love Tintin! Anderson newcomers Benicio Del Toro, Timothée Chalamet, and Jeffrey Wright all kill it in their starring role. Adrian Brody plays another villain role, and while I'm sure he's a nice guy in real life, he's very skilled at playing bad people. Lina Kudry as Juliette, the revolutionary student, does a great job too. I like the detail about how she only speaks French, Chalamet only speaks English, and yet they're somehow able to understand each other. I think their enemies to lovers bit was very well written. Thematically speaking, I enjoyed the third one, most. The underlying theme of being a foreign minority in a European country came off very well written to me. Also, even before I watched multiple video essays about this movie, I had a good feeling that Wright's character was based on James Baldwin. In terms of how much I actually enjoyed each short, I would put the second one on top, although each of them is great. You just know all the teenage fangirls love seeing Timmy Chalamet shirtless in this one. 
To date, his most recent movie, I'd heard a lot going into this one about how it was his most complex film yet. Once I finished watching it, I understood why. It took me the longest out of all his films to properly grasp what was going on, but once I did, I enjoyed it even more. The framing device definitely takes some getting used to, the whole play within a documentary shtick. I didn't fully understand the whole you can't wake up if you don't fall asleep thing until I looked it up afterward, but even then, I was still able to enjoy it in the moment just based based on how silly it was. Jason Schwartzman does a great job in this, and I love his interactions with his family. In particular, his breaking the news to his kids that their mom has died three weeks after she's actually passed is hilarious. His interactions with Scarlett Johansson are also a nice touch, and they have great chemistry. Steve Carell is a perfect choice for the character he plays, the overly happy motel manager. A role like that needs the Michael Scott voice. Margot Robbie is only in one scene, and yet her role is one of the best. I know I gave a spoiler warning, but I'm not going to spoil her scene. You'll have to watch it yourself. The film's visuals are perfect as usual. For how barren a desert setting inherently is, they make it look super nice, as vibrant as a desert can be. Thematically, this is a kind of film that could have only been written during quarantine. I'm far from the first person to bring this up, but I'll do it anyway. Sometimes crazy things happen and everything changes. Then things will return to normal without a proper explanation. That's just how life works sometimes. Life doesn't have to make sense, and it often doesn't. While media inspired by you know what isn't usually something I enjoy, this film is an exception just based on how fun it is. I do think this film is held back a bit just by how much stuff it tries to cram in. I think Jason Schwartzman getting over his dead wife could have been given some more time, and his son's romance feels a little sudden. Still, the movie is great, and you should see it. So yeah, there are my thoughts on... Every Wes Anderson movie. Well, go and watch them now, I guess. Okay, I know I said I wouldn't be ranking the movies, but I lied. Here's my ranking. If you're still watching by now, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me your time. If you like what you saw, be sure to like and hit subscribe. I make these videos whenever I can, and I always have a ton of fun making them. Hopefully you have as much fun watching them. If you have an idea for a video you want me to do, leave it in the comments. Who knows, maybe I'll get to it. Although... Try to make it music-based and not movie-based, since that is, at the end of the day, what this channel is mainly about. I'm Robbie J 2734 I will see you when I see you next.